Missionaries, a special book project with Create and Learn, by Ishan Kalari and Siddharth Vikram. Introduction. Human Factors and Behavioral Performance, HFBP, research is conducted by NASA to help prepare for successful long-duration space flights and manage the behavioral health effects of long-duration space flight. These effects include those related to isolation, confinement, sleep loss, personal conflicts and burnout. The human element in a mission to Mars will be decisive to its success or failure. How can a team of astronaut specialists be successfully assembled and trained to ensure the success of such a mission? In Missionaries authors Ishan Kalari and Siddharth Vikram tell an exciting and sometimes humorously tragic tale about what might happen when a team of astronauts on a long-term space mission do not always work well together. More ominously there is a criminal mystery element embedded in the story which will challenge readers to reconsider the way they perceive astronauts. The people portrayed in these pages are not the disciplined, selfless kind of human beings we have come to expect astronauts to be. I hope you enjoy this light-hearted story which packs a very serious message and warning. Bruce Callow. Le Vive Ukraine, October 2023. Chapter 1, The Meeting. The Infinity Space Agency, ISA, needed to get to Mars and fast. NASA and SpaceX were pursuing the idea. We need to work fast. It is the year 2063 and this is the third iteration and if this runs too late we will all go bankrupt. The science lab is working around the clock and we have almost let it loose. We have to move fast. This was Denver, an ESA head scientist and engineer. We only have a few billion dollars and have no crew. NASA is going to find our ideas any minute now. He would call a meeting about classified material. Denver went to the control room and started calling on the loudspeaker meeting in room 198 in 10 minutes. He knew that then everyone would come. He marched into the room and started drawing. Let's start, started Denver when everybody entered and got seated, with naming our rocket. Let's name it Blaster, someone said. No, Denver said. Let's vote on it, someone else said. Fine then, all in favor, Denver asked. Only two out of the fifty people there raised their hands. Can we get a raise? Someone asked. No, this is a meeting. Denver screamed. Someone has anger issues. That person muttered. Denver saw a young man on his phone. Mr. Katarain, what would you propose? Denver focused his attention on that fool. Mm, Mr. Katarain was thinking under pressure. His shoe slipped and he fell down and his head fell to the side of the desk and he flipped and fell bump first and his phone fell down, and Denver saw something unforgettable. Mr. Katarain wet his pants. Bravo, what an amazing athletic movement, Denver stared coldly. Ares is the Roman god of Mars. And also the Greek god of war and he has a spear so I think of Ares' spear. Mr. Katarain blurted out. All of Denver's anger was gone, he actually wanted it to be named that. All in favor? He asked. Immediately 25 hands shut up. He was surprised when one more hand went up. Denver began, it's decided the name is officially Ares' spear. Let's review the failed missions for those of you who are unaware. The first one exploded when someone farted on board and the pilot thought there was a leakage on board and so he turned off the engines when they were still close to the earth which caused the crash. The velocity was reading back to earth. The second one was when cookie crumbs got stuck in the engines as ignition occurred and so once again it fell back to earth. But this time we will get it right. The mission is to take place on a NASA launch pad because of the budget and it is scheduled to happen on this day and time in five months, Denver concluded now get to work on the rocket. Denver slipped onto the floor too and saw Mr. Jones had a smile on his face and yelled at him. He then dismissed everyone. This is hard work. Chapter 2, Hardcore Training. Denver was thinking about the selection process. Okay just grab a bunch of people interested in space and be done with it. I'll tell them to add a number generator to get this done but maybe double check their profiles. And while we are launching the ship we should use our radio blaster as a diversion for NASA. Mr. Farty. Get the nuclear reserves ready, Denver told his second-in-command scientist who was walking by him on his way to coffee break. Yes sir. Also should I post astronaut selection ads? Because in the meeting I heard you say Mr. Farty, stop looking at your phone. I get very annoyed when you get distracted and I'm looking for someone to work on an ad to get our astronauts and nobody wants to code it so you should make it. Mr. Farty started, so should I do it? Denver slapped his head and Mr. Farty in response said, so um. Sorry stupid question. True, Denver mumbled weakly. Okay so I'll get that off my list Mr. Farty said. What, Denver yelled when I did that, I was slapping myself because of your stupidity. Next time IT will be you I slap. 
these idiots and morons can't do anything, Denever mumbled as Mr. Farty quickly walked away. Three weeks later. Denever gazed at the crew that had been selected with enormous disdain while the crew's chief engineer Theodore Kingston chatted with Dr. Willow Sidney. The crew members in order were. Derek DeMalvin, Commander. Theodore Kingston, Engineer. Willow Sidney, Medical Doctor. Prakash Sharma, Geologist. Leilani Makatuk, Botanist. Elizabeth Campbell, Physicist. Okay, let's see what you can do. Denever started. My assistant and a few other members will guide you through a curriculum on our flight. I understand the challenges that you are currently going through. I hope you stay alive, Denever said in an ominous voice. Denever wanted to scare the astronauts into getting serious. We will start by studying our space curriculum so you're going back to school. After that you will practice spin rotations to get you used to space. And we have a truckload of simulators to train you. Woo! Willow Sidney exclaimed yay this is amazing. Her voice was kind of high-pitched for a woman and sounded more like a kid. Okay, makes sense but this is boring, grumbled Prakash Sharma, the geologist with a deep voice. I'll write that down, mumbled Elizabeth Campbell, making a mental note. Let's start your time here. Get comfy and enjoy our apartment room 798. Denever concluded the meeting now get out of the rocket room. They cleared out of the room and Denever assisted with work on the rocket's thrusters. Later Denever was called to stay at the training sessions and watch every single one. It was annoying but he enjoyed seeing the astronauts gasp as they were in the low O2 chamber. He watched as they floated in a low G environment. They were acceptable. He also instructed them to start sleeping in their water beds. To save energy in space there are certain beds that are used. While they are there they are in a semi-conscious state while they are slowly being fed small bits of food so they don't waste energy. Finally they completed their training. Denver looked at the date and felt amazed as there were only two weeks left till launch. Chapter 3, Blast Off With almost one week to the launch, Denver is deciding whether or not to hack into NASA's computer to make sure NASA didn't think anything was suspicious because the rocket was shaped like an ice cream cone. It is possible that's not going to end well with NASA. So Denever begins working on the hacking process while the astronauts are doing last-minute training. The launch day finally arrives. Denever is working on last-minute hacking, getting the radio signal to distract all of NASA's telescopes so we can launch way more smoothly. Denever is telling the astronauts to be brave and come back alive or I will kill you. T-30 D-29 T-28 D-27 D-26 D-25 D-24 D-23 T-22, T-21, T-20, T-19, T-18, T-17, T-16, T-15, T-14, T-13, T-12, T-11, T-10. T no stop, launch ID already, said Denover. The rocket launch shook the ground for miles flattening trees and as that all happened, NASA smirked seeing that there was a spy among the crewmates. On the other hand, the astronauts were not having a good laugh. The pressure on them was making them want to die. A few hours of torture later. Denver watched from cameras as the astronauts were doing their assigned tasks. Botanist Leilani Makatukin was starting to plant a garden. In the doctor's chamber Willow Sidney was mixing a few chemicals and sorting bandages. In the geology room Prakash Sharma was shining a light through quartz rocks. And of course the rocket smelt badly due to the abundance of poop on board. Let's get to know each other a bit said Commander, Derek DeMalvin. I'm Derek and I'm 36 years old. I live in the UK. I'm Willow Sydney and I'm 38 years old. I am based in Sydney, Australia. Sydney introduced herself. I'm Theodore Kingston from Michigan and I'm 36 years old and I hope we don't die because I have a bet, Theodore Kingston jokes. Prakash Sharma grumbles why should I do this? And he stormed out. Well I have the file for him, Derek said, Prakash Sharma is 35 years old. He is based in New Delhi, India and likes to collect rocks. Hi everyone, my name is Leilani Makatuk. I am 34 years old, I am based in Maui, Hawaii and I like video games she said in a low voice. Okay, my name is Elizabeth Campbell. I am 37 years old, I am based in Lisbon, Portugal, I like to play instruments. After they introduced themselves, Denver gently reminded them, yelled at them, about their waterbeds. Denver watched as all of the astronauts got in their beds. Denver also told them about a satellite ESA launched close to the surface of Mars. The crew was then slowly talking about how Denver was really mean and annoying and slowly became unconscious in their water beds. 
Then a mysterious figure arises from the waterbeds and blocks and destroys the cameras, goes into the kitchen where it gets food and eats it like a madman. This mysterious beast also goes into Dr. Willow Sidney's room then goes into the botanist's room, the physicist's room, the commander's cockpit, the geologist's room and the engineer's workroom. The figure steals something from each of the crew members' rooms and then goes back into his slash her waterbed. Chapter 4, A Red Surface Commander Derek DeMalvin was sleeping. A very kind-hearted person, he often fails to notice obvious downsides in people. His main priority was to keep the team together and he often thought of them as brothers and sisters. Wee you wee you wee you, a loud alarm suddenly came pouring from a speaker just then. Derek suddenly woke up as his waterbed started draining out. He woke up looking at the red giant, Mars smack dab in his face. The still drowsy astronaut began to remember the drill and started emptying the waterbeds of the other crew members. Everybody came to their senses and sat down in their seats. Derek started the landing sequence and they gently landed on the crater below. Derek set foot on the red, dusty surface and yelled, Mars, you are a stepping stone for more challenges to come for humankind. He really didn't have time to enjoy being on the surface because he had work to do. The first thing the crew did was set up their base on the surface and build their stations. Derek assigned all of the crew members to start their work in their posts. For the next two months Derek and the crew worked very hard to make the base on Mars as amazing as possible and the crew had also been doing a lot of research. Leilani Makachan was working as hard as possible on making a greenhouse filled with plants. On the other hand, geologist Prakash Sharma was collecting and studying the fascinating red rocks. Engineer Theodore Kingston was talking to Derek DeMalvin on the ship and had some bad news to share. Derek said that the ship might not be able to make it back to Earth when it is time to leave Mars. Derek was trying to suggest solutions to fix it but Theodore told him they would take a very long time. Derek and Theodore did not know what to do at all and they might not be able to make it back. Of course unpacking on Mars is hard but luckily there is a diagram of the base. Is the base completed? He asked, surveying the field. What do you think? Prakash Sharma asked. Um, no, Derek replied. So why did you ask? Prakash argued. Let's all calm down, Derek said. The team was hard to manage and Derek dealt with this every day. But he liked his team even so. As he watched all the astronauts work he saw the rocket remains buried and wondered if the oxygen from the plants could fuel it once more. He knew that the mechanisms needed a supply of fuel. We're going to make this work for sure. Chapter 5 a revelation of water. Living on Mars was no vacation. You have to worry about so many things. Let's start with breathing. How to do that? And there is also radiation, heat, and food and water supply issues to deal with. Engineer Theodore Kingston had to work fast and hard. He was working on building a dome that used heat for energy and purified water. He also was making an augmented reality dog to help keep people stay emotionally stable. Almost done with the greenhouse. He called out to anyone who could hear him. The botanist did, and she gave him a bravo. Thanks, he replied. Later, when there was a crew meeting, he focused on two important issues. Someone is stealing our food. We are all going to die. And also, I am done with the greenhouse. The app is made, and our dome is mostly done, but I just need to install an outer metal wall with insulation. And there will be no AC on the ship. That caused a lot of grumbling. Hey, we will have to rough it out, won't we? Theodore tried to encourage them. But did they listen? No. And so they were about as grumpy as gorillas. Wanna hear a joke? Theodore asked. No. Everybody in the crew screamed. What type of coffee store is in space? He asked. I don't know, all the astronauts immediately replied. Starbucks, Theodore answered and laughed. Nobody else did however. The next day Theodore inspected the broken rocket parts. He thought they were way more useful as a moving object. A buggy? Yes, a buggy. If I spend this day working maybe, just maybe. One day later. The buggy is ready. Theodore Kingston exclaimed. He put both feet on it, just like a motorcycle and rode it three miles west of the base. It took roughly ten minutes. And when he stopped he did so because something was off. There was a scent in the air, it was something familiar but not something that they were trained to recognize. There was a ringing on his instruments. He pulled out the one that was ringing. It said humidity is high. Water. Fresh water, he yelled. He immediately struck his beacon to call others. He took out his pickaxe, he had a slot in the buggy for tools, and he began digging for the water. After a few minutes he decided to track the water with a humidity scanner. By then everyone had come to check what the heck happened. They helped him look for water. 
and they made a grid and found the most promising digging spot. They dug and soon found a site where the air was high in humidity. They observed water vapor leaking quickly and covered the top of it with rock and started piling more around the area. The group thought it was hopeless but Theodore convinced them to wait until nightfall. Theodore was thinking silently about what to do next. When night fell it dropped to freezing temperatures so everyone huddled near their generators. When it was one and a half hours into the night everyone started getting up and digging till they struck something metallic. It looked like iron. Yes that could help. The crew carted the iron and on the other side of it there was a huge underground lake. Theodore explained, in the morning it must have been so hot that the water evaporated but now it has condensed and turned to liquid and some geothermal energy is heating it. Also the iron we found must be feeding it minerals so it might be safe to drink after treatment. Where is the water? Chapter 6, The Martian Giant After they came back with the ore Prakash Sharma suggested making a trip to Olympus Mons. After a couple weeks of preparing for their trip, the crew finally set off to Olympus Mons in their Mars rover. It was a fun but hard trip. There were many bathroom stops, a lot of stops. On the way Prakash Sharma had noticed something wrong with the crew, they looked starved. Prakash was also feeling very, very hungry. Arg, I can't do this, I need food, Derek said in a groaning voice. Same here, this food shortage is killing me, Theodore whispered. I thought you would never ask, said Leilani. Let me just get out our portable garden. Leilani struggled to get the garden out and by the time she did, it was empty. What, now we really are starving, Elizabeth said. Same here actually, I feel hungry too, and I never really feel hungry. Prakash said. Whatever, we will just have to get through this, said Derek. While he was saying that, the crew finally stumbled on Olympus Mons, it was crazily gigantic and rose from the surface like a monster. Wow, how are we going to do this, what is our plan anyway? Elizabeth Campbell asked confusedly. We will try to climb it for a little while and collect samples for studies, Derek said. Okay, that seems simple, right? Leilani said. No one answered and they started to walk closer to the sides of the Great Olympus Mons. Then it happened all of a sudden. A violent and ever-growing dust storm was approaching fast. Ah uh, Derek what will we do? Elizabeth asked. We will proceed forward. Derek said confidently. Yeah right, like we could ever do that, Prakash said with a very grumbly voice. But still, we will trek it, said Derek. The six nervous Mars explorers started to scale the slopes of the summit with their specialized climbing equipment with the hope of finding signs of life. Botanist Leilani was theorizing about planting potentially Mars-friendly plants there to check if they would grow. The crew had planned to use their portable base to set up camp there for the night. They did so very close to the summit and up there the climate was harsh. Prakash had decided to conduct his own research. Leilani was making very amazing progress with her plant studies. The plants that she had planted had grown a little. She had thought it was impossible. In the meantime, Derek DeMalvin was finding out a way to solve this food mystery crisis. The food for the crew was gone. He didn't know what to do, so he made an announcement to the crew. Hello, crew of missionaries, I treat you all like brothers and sisters, but now we have a crisis. Someone or something is stealing our food. We do not have enough. Even though Leilani is doing an amazing job on the plant farm, we still don't have enough food. We need a way to get our dehydrated food back, and even if Leilani is growing the plants, someone is stealing that too. Derek completed his speech and everyone fell silent, literally dead silent. Soon later Derek advised the team to look out for anyone acting suspicious. After a couple days of researching life, rocks, and plants at Olympus Mons, the crew had packed up and had decided to go back to home base. The crew got in the rovers and drove back. Soon, they reached their home camp and steadily continued to starve. No food, nothing. Leilani had started to plant more and more vegetables and plants while Prakash had gotten back to his boring work of staring at red rocks. Chapter 7 Dust Storms and Tremors. Mars is so enthralling, there are many things to do explore and research. The crew's botanist loves Mars so much and her research on plants is going amazingly and she is progressing a lot in her studies. But one thing she doesn't like is Theodore Kingston, who is currently annoying her a lot about his projects. Hey, look at my new addition to the rocket, it is a toilet, Theodore exclaimed. Seriously, a toilet? Leilani said, not surprised. Yes, a toilet. Okay, amazing, Leilani said with the accent of this guy's a weirdo. Hey, wanna hear a joke? Theodore asked. Ah, uh, sure. Okay, what is the difference between mechanical engineers and civil engineers? Ah, uh, what? 
mechanical engineers build weapons, and civil engineers build targets. Ah, uh, okay, Leilani said while Theodore was cackling like a madman. Ah, uh, see you, Leilani said while starting to exit the room. When Theodore finally stopped he said, wanna hear another joke? Ah, uh, no I'm good thank you. Leilani suggested while walking out of the room. While Leilani was getting her space suit on, something terrible happened. It was a powerful tremor. It shook the whole section of the planet that they were on. But the worst part for Leilani was hearing Theodore scream as his toilet gets malfunctioned. Theodore was literally howling like a wolf. Oh whoa oh 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 oh. Theodore quit it. Derek yells. Sorry. Theodore apologizes. Leilani goes outside to see her greenhouse fall over, and like Theodore, she howls with sadness. Come on. That is so unfair. Leilani complains. I've worked so hard for TH Prakash interrupts. Yeah, we are all going through sadness, my Martian rock collection has been destroyed. Uck, whatever, so rude. Leilani mutters about Prakash. I heard you, you know Prakash yells. A couple of days later. All right guys, it is our final weeks on this beautiful red planet, pack everything up, Derek announces. As the crew and a heartbroken Theodore walk out, Theodore is heartbroken because of his toilet addition that broke, they see something in the distance. Ugh guys, it's a dust storm. Theodore screams. Okay, guys get everything inside and packed. Derek commands. Yes sir, everyone yells. Don't call me sir, call me Derek. He announces. Leilani and Prakash run quickly to their stations. Go, go. Derek yells. What about that satellite ESA launch to communicate with us, it is not far above the surface so it might get hit by the dust storm? Theodore asks. Bring it down, we will launch it back soon. Derek replies. Yes CO, sorry, I mean yes Derek. Theodore goes to a computer to bring the satellite down. Shake shake. Chapter 8, The Food Thief. Mars is the worst, there is nothing to do, besides research. We can't even watch new movies. Like Mission Impossible 14 which was released last week. I mean, come on, this is Denver's fault. He is so rude. And they have turned me into their walking computer. Elizabeth Campbell is very, very hungry and angry because of the food thief. This food thief was like no other. Elizabeth was thinking that when she finds this terrible thief, she would literally do whatever the food thief did to them. Later on that day the crew had an important meeting to plan their next actions. When Elizabeth walked in she yelled, when I find that food thief, I will literally scream my lungs out at that person. Leilani soon changed the topic of the food thief. She had found an interesting discovery about colonization on Mars. She had said that Mars colonization has been proven to be true based on the fossil records. It seems that human activity spoiled it. There was a spacecraft sent by someone to deterraform Mars and wipe out all existing personnel. These findings were based on the discovery of buried rocket parts near the planet's south pole. In these sites fossils were shown that represented two distinct life forms. One life form was capable of breathing the iron rust on Mars the other had a completely different respiration process. The crew led by Leilani this time had decided to make a quick trip to prove what Leilani had discovered. Of course Prakash had a bad attitude as always. When they called Denever and told him about the crew's findings, he was unusually nervous. But the crew took no heed of that. They went on their journey to find further proof. The crew then stumbled upon what Leilani was talking about, a buried rocket motor. Leilani was soon explaining about the rocket piece when the bad attitude man, Prakash Sharma walked away thinking the crew wouldn't notice him. He was slowly walking for several minutes when members of the crew noticed his absence and called out to him. To stop the crew from doing their boring business he ran back to the base so they would stop doing it. He ran and soon when he saw and heard that the crew was back he acted as though he had to go to the bathroom. After the meeting in the expedition Elizabeth has had enough. She goes to where the crew usually gets food and hides to wait and see who is stealing the food. She then bumps into Leilani and the rest of the crew other than Willow. They were all thinking about the same plan. She wonders if one of them was the food thief. The five members of the crew patiently wait until someone came walking, it was Willow Sidney. The doctor. She grabs some carrots and before she reaches the door the five crew members get up to hear an explanation. Willow, what is this? Derek exclaims. Guys I was only taking it to keep you guys safe. The doctor has to be healthy to keep you healthy, Willow explains in a very dark and deep voice. The crew was surprised. What is this? Derek yells in confusion. Why did you do this? Because I worked for NASA. Everyone was surprised by this. 
The crew immediately contacted Denever who had hacked into NASA before the launch. Denever was then screaming at them. Okay, okay I'm sorry I didn't show you before. Dear little Willow Sydney, there was a NASA spy. I was going to lock her up anyway, Denever yelled. The crew was shocked, Willow Sydney looked horrified, her face aghast. No, no, no this can't be happening to me. I have a family. Well too bad. Denever yells this time in delight. Crew. You will have to listen to me and put her in the cooler pod. This is for the good of mankind, Denver commanded. Guys, we are friends, come on, you have to help me. Willow pleaded. Well sorry Willow we trusted you, and you really let us down. Willow, what is happening here? Why are you stealing food? Chapter 9, Return to Earth. The crew was very upset that their friend had been taken away. They had found proof and evidence that colonies could be formed on Mars, but they had lost a great friend on the way. Derek DeMalvin was vigorously thinking of a good speech to renew the crew's broken spirit. All right everyone, I know what is upsetting you and I am upset too, Derek said confidently. Oh, so you know that I am sad that Theodore's toilet got broken? Prakash said. The crew howled with laughter. Ha, ha, very funny, but no, if you are sad about Willow going then that is what I mean. Denver said the deadline is in two days. We have to repair the rocket to get it going so we can get back to Earth. Okay. Everyone let's do it, let's fix the rocket, and the toilet too. Prakash rose up stiffly, as always with his bad attitude. The crew got to work on fixing the Ares' spear. They were vigorously working for hours and hours throughout the whole day. After their task was completed the rocket was ready for launch. The crew had decided to pack and start early. Derek made a speech slash announcement. Okay crew, all of us will be going to launch the rocket in precisely three hours. Three hours later. OK team we are all prepped for launch. All systems go. Derek hits the red launch button and most of the crew members are howling with tears that they are leaving the red planet. Bye, bye Mars Theodore says in a babyish voice. Don't worry Theodore, Leilani says supporting him, you'll be alright. A couple of hours later when the crew is in space Theodore goes to the Earth communication phone and calls his son Bobby, and the crew can hear Theodore screaming at his son because Bobby misses dinner to talk with him. After that. Quite ironically, Theodore also misses dinner and the crew asks him to go to the cooler and check on Willow Sydney and he accepts Dot at the cooler Theodore notices that Willow is gone. Theodore screams like a madman, running towards the crew. Guys, Willow is gone, she escaped. What? The crew yells in unison. It's true. Theodore proclaims hardly able to hide his shock. We just have to let her go. She was kind of suspicious anyway. Derek says. Five months later. The crew lurched awake from their water beds to a disturbance in the rocket. The crew goes to check on the disturbance and there is a bomb placed by Willow Sydney as she was escaping, she placed it in the engine. The crew put on their space suits, got on the connection wire and carefully picked up the bomb. They went outside the airlock and before it hit the 10 seconds mark, Derek, who was the strongest on the crew, chucked it away like a football before it could explode. Boom the bomb explodes mid-air without contact with the rocket. The crew are safe and they get back to their water beds and fall back to sleep again. Two months later. Derek wakes up to a communication noise that is advising to prepare for landing. He does that and without waking the crew so they can be surprised that they are home. Derek slowly but carefully lands the ship. He wakes up the crew, and shows them Earth once again. They see their families and everyone in the huge welcoming crowd lifts. Chapter 10, Return to Earth. That is the end. Okay class, did you guys like the story? The teacher asks her class while closing the book. This is how we got to Mars, and also that's why this colony hub is called We Hate Denver. It is also why Willow Sydney is wanted. Does anyone have any questions or comments? A girl named Daisy DeMalvin lifts her hand up with great pride and joy. Class, all of you will go to detention for laughing so disrespectfully at Daisy, but she will not go. And since you laughed at her you will have no recess for the rest of the school year. You may play at home but not at school, no chance. This detention will take effect immediately. The class groaned. Well we are a no bullying school so this punishment serves you right. Ding, 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 the bell rang. My great grandpa was on this expedition, he was Derek de Malvin, and when I grow up I want to be just like him, an astronaut, but on an expedition to Jupiter. The class laughed uproariously. Remember class, no recess tomorrow, so finish up playing today. Daisy went home with a gigantic smile on her face. Her mother Dixie DeMalvin came to pick Daisy up in their hover car. 
Hey Daisy, how did the day go? I learned about my great grandpa. Daisy replies. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah we read a book for 5 hours straight that's all. Daisy says with pride. Well, he is a hero, he is the best person ever to have lived. He saved us all. Dixie concludes. The technology has advanced, life on Mars is changing, and fast. Cities are new and futuristic, the kids' school routine has changed thoroughly. Mars is a great planet to live on. The impossible has been achieved and around 50,000 people now live on Mars. The End